Hello, I am Matt Jacobson. I am a general partner at Iconic Growth. We are a global investment platform that invests on behalf of exceptional individuals that you know, run many of the largest kind of companies, industries, and countries globally. And you know, we partnered with many exceptional companies on that journey, uh, including Datadog, and thrilled to be here and joined by Olivier, in addition to companies like Snowflake, Adyen, GitLab, Procore, Service Titan, and many others speaking today, including you know, Braze, Drata, Writer, and, uh, and Pigment, among others. And you know, just absolutely thrilled and honored to be here with Olivier Pomel, who is the co-founder and CEO of Datadog. You know, it's been, uh, I think I've been, had the pleasure to work with Olivier for over the last nine years, and through that experience, I've just learned so many incredible things that I'm excited to communicate and share through this, uh, through this session. And one of the you know, key insights is that uh, you know, every way that Olivier and his team have built Datadog has been unconventional uh, in terms of you know, shifting from conventional norms, thinking from you know, first principles or at least fresh principles, and you know, kind of setting the stage. And one of the learnings that I've had over the years is that you know, some of the most exceptional businesses in the world you know, really do kind of blaze their own path and their own journey. And I hope that this journey into you know, many of the unconventional decisions that Datadog has taken will be an inspiration to you know, many founders and investors in terms of you know, thinking about the, uh, the, the world. You know, we live in a world where there's a lot of playbooks and, uh, and benchmarking, and my partner Vivian is going to speak about uh, you know, benchmarking you know, later, but uh, there's something really special about you know, taking your own perspective. So thank you, Olivier, for, uh, for being here and sharing this perspective. Thank you. So, you know, to start, I think many years ago, you said something that, uh, you know, one of the strengths of Datadog was that you were always, I think, suspicious of, uh, of conventional wisdom. When somebody said, you yeah, know, we do this because this is the way it is, or, you yeah, know, we build products this way because this is how we built them at Google, or, you yeah, know, we do sales territories this way because that's how they did them at, uh, at Salesforce, you immediately became suspicious and wanted to think about things from first principles. We'd love to just understand how that kind of suspicion around conventional wisdom has guided you over the years? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, um, thanks for having me. Um, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in general, um, so I, I, I'm the, the portrait of a, um, a survivorship bias. So, you know, this, this, this might apply or not apply. You know, the good thing about, you know, when you're being contrarian, uh, it's great when you're, when you're right. But when you're wrong, you look really stupid because obviously everybody knew it. You know, it was not the way to do it, and you're wrong, and you had it coming. You know, so that's just a preface, you know, to everything we're going to say. Uh, from the very beginning, when we started that, uh, we were not a, an obvious winner. Like we were not one of the companies that, uh, you know, when we raised the seed round, like the, the VCs didn't fall over to invest in our company. Um, we didn't get into Y Combinator. We can come back to that maybe. Like we were, you know, not successful from day one, and so. We, we, from the very beginning, we felt like we, we had to craft our own path. Uh, we come to be very suspicious of what we've heard as um, common wisdom. Uh, we thought that if we're, we were going to beat the companies that were started mostly in Silicon Valley, mostly with uh, way more connections, way more money than we had, we had to proceed differently from the way we were doing. I think looking uh, now where we are today, you know, as a public company, having scaled to billions of dollars in revenue, as a result of that, I think we built a company that has better economics, that has uh, better systems, and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to tell you more. You know, I think w one of the kind of centerpieces of you know, that unique journey at Datadog has been kind of the products and platform that you've built, and you know, I think today uh, Datadog has over 20 products and 50 you know, different pro you know, billable SKUs that, uh, that customers could buy. And you know, the breadth of the product portfolio and the usage across the customer base is something that's been considered best in class uh, across many companies in the market. And uh, I've heard many founders and many companies look to this and say, hey, uh, oh my god, I want to replicate Datadog's multi-product strategy and success you know, so much. And so they rush to, uh, to build many, many products. But in reality, I think you built a platform before you built a, a product which was you know, 
uh, unconventional at the, uh, at the time and probably not loved by investors. And then you know, focused on a single product for seven years before building your you know, second product. So we'd love to learn some of the w unconventional ways that you've built out this incredible product portfolio at Datadog. Yeah, so the first thing is, so you're right, like the, the starting point for Datadog was to get people from different teams to talk to each other. So the, the backstory there is that in a previous company, I was running the, the dev team, my co-founder at Datadog was running, was working with, with me then, and was running the ops team. Uh, we hired everyone on our teams, uh, we were very good friends, and we still ended up with uh, a development team that hated operations, the operations, operations team that hated development, people pointing fingers at each other all the time. So what, um, we started Datadog to bring everyone un under one roof. So we built a platform that would serve multiple, multiple teams, multiple use cases, all of that into one product, and give them the same language, the same, the same vision into the world. Then we started fundraising for this vision, um, and nobody wanted to invest in it. Uh, so I said it earlier, we didn't get to Y Combinator. I have an email from Paul Graham that says um, that starting with a platform is a, is a bad idea, and that a platform is only as good as its first product, and as a result, they would invest in us. Um, and it happened pretty much everywhere. We released the first, we, st we still kept pushing forward with that. We released our first product, which was this very open-ended data platform where people could collaborate. Uh, the users we presented it to, they loved the idea of it. Um, they started you know, using it, they wanted an, in an invite, they uh, onboarded into our product. But they sort of forgot to come back afterwards, and they didn't really convert into anything that was paying. We didn't actually know who to charge for it. Nobody knew how to explain that they needed a collaboration data platform to their bosses, so it was going nowhere fast. After that, we uh, understood that we actually needed to have a, uh, a very first product, like a very first category that our customers understood. So we went after infrastructure monitoring, even though our product didn't look like infrastructure monitoring, we could credibly call it that way. Everybody understood what it was, why they would come back to it, how they would present it to their boss. But the product was the same. It was still an open-ended data platform. Um, after that, it took us maybe seven years until we pick, picked up the idea of the platform again. Uh, and we developed product number two and product number three pretty much at the same time. Uh, one internally, one from acquisition. Um, and then we, we made the platform strategy successful, I would say, in uh, 2018, 2019, which is when we felt confident enough about, about the business to, uh, to take it public, uh, basically. But it was, what's interesting is when we look at where we are today um, and when we started, we actually, what we see in Datadog today is the vision as we had it in 2010. Um, it just was very wrong for a very long time and very difficult to get it started until it was obvious that it was the right thing, I would say, seven or eight years later. And I think, I think that's the biggest learning. If you want to build something truly great, you need to be willing to be wrong for a long period of time and you know, kind of steadfast in terms of that, uh, that, that focus. And thank you for sharing some of those stories. You, know, the, uh, you touched upon you know, M&A uh, yeah. in terms of one of those, you know, uh, the, the third product, uh, in terms of logs with the acquisition of Logmatic, but you've acquired a number of different companies and you know, I think um, there have been mixed experiences across the landscape as we've seen in terms of M&A, but you've been very fortunate to retain many of these teams and they've gone on to build substantial products at, uh, at Datadog. You know, what are the kind of unconventional ways that you've approached acquisitions that have been so successful in terms of this journey? Yeah, so, so it's been successful for us. So today we're about uh, Let's call it between two and a half and three billion in, uh, in uh, recurring revenue. And about a third of that uh, comes from acquisitions. Um, and those companies, when we acquired them in total, they, they were less than 10 million in AR. So you know, all of that growth happened substantially after we acquired those companies and we built that into our, our platform. Um, in general, acquisitions don't work all that well. Like, they tend to fail. They tend to, to be a, a big issue. Uh, I think we try to do things differently at several levels. The first one is we don't look at specific areas for acquisition. You know, we don't start saying, hey, uh, we want to enter this market. You know, we want to, en to enter the, I don't know, the data security market. And so we're going to find a company in data security to buy. And in six months, we'll have bought one and we'll, we'll be on our way. Um, instead, what we do is uh, we look broadly at our roadmap. We're a platform company, so we have a very broad roadmap that covers a lot of different categories. Like we're pretty sure we need to build lots of different things over the next you know, four to five years. And we're very open-ended 
uh, and opportunistic about what we can find uh, that fits on that roadmap. And what we can't buy will be lost sales, but you know, we'll, we'll be open to find uh, uh, companies in these different areas. What it allows us to do is to be extremely selective on the companies we buy. Uh, we don't have to buy something in a specific area. Instead, we'll see what we find, uh, and we can focus more on are these the, the right cultural fit? Uh, are we in the right um, uh, step in that company's evolution? Like, is it the right time for us in acquisition? Uh, and are, do these people want to sell to us uh, in order to build? Uh, so they're going to be with us afterward. So the first thing is we have a very wide funnel. We're very opportunistic in that funnel. Uh, the second thing is um, we focus on what happens after the deal. Um, the, we make the deals themselves very selective on why people want to sell. You know, so if people want to sell uh, because they want to walk away from their business, they're tired of it. Uh, it's a great reason to sell. Uh, it's not a great reason to sell to us. Um, so we structure the deals in a way that focuses on keeping people around, making sure they want to build, make sure they're going to be with us for two, three, four, five years after that, and build the next generation of products with us. And then as soon as we decide to move with the company, we focus completely on what happens after the acquisition. Uh, we focus on making sure we have a sense of urgency, making sure we understand what we're going to ship in three to six to nine months after we do an acquisition, making sure that we show value very quickly, uh, both to the company that we bought, but also inter internally. You know, the biggest issue when you buy a company is not that, or the biggest risk, is not that you're going to waste uh, the money you spend on the acquisition. The biggest risk is that you're going to demoralize everybody in your own organization uh, because they'll wonder why you bought this, this company, why you know, maybe some of these people made money, uh, and what the company gets out of it, you know, why they who are in the seat uh, are not the ones you know, who, are the, 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 uh, who get all of this attention directed at them. And so you need to prove that you know, very quickly that yes, you're getting, you're getting extra value, you're getting acceleration, you're getting amazing people, and, and all that is working well. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been amazing to, uh, to watch that come to fruition and that, that your data point that you shared in terms of a third of the uh, business from you know, these acquisitions all built onto the platform, thinking about that post-mortem. It's something we've extended to the way we think about partnerships as well, and you know, just unbelievably valuable to have that mindset. The you know, geography, we're sitting here in Helsinki, uh, and you know, Datadog's a global company, but you know, maybe in that rejection letter from, uh, from YC or other things, conventional wisdom, you know, when you started and founded Datadog was to build a highly technical company in Silicon Valley, and you chose to you know, build Datadog in, in New York as a starting point. You know, many of these acquisitions, uh, you built out a, a massive team in, in Paris before that was your kind of conventional wisdom of a, of a significant technology hub and you know, built into other places in Europe uh, and globally. You know, we'd just love to walk through some of these decisions that you made in terms of the unconventional approach towards geography and you know, how that's made Datadog the company that it is today. Yeah, and there I, th I would say, so first of all, it's not as controversial today to build a tech company in New York and in Europe. I think it, it happens readily. I mean, everybody hears the proof of that. Um, it was less the case in uh, 2010. Like in 2010, when you started an infrastructure company in New York, there was probably something wrong with you. And um, that's what we felt when we pitched investors. By the way, we pitched investors in New York and they didn't quite understand. Uh, so they loved the idea, but they didn't quite understand the domain and they didn't feel confident moving forward. And then when we pitched investors in the Bay Area, they understood the domain very well, and they just didn't think that you could build something, something successful for that in, in New York. So part of that, I would say, uh, comforted us in our uh, contrarian ways. You know, we basically had a gigantic chip on our shoulder, and we, th we thought, OK, we need to, we're going to show, show, show to them that it's possible to do so. Uh, but I would say, you know, after that, uh, we got a lot of, uh, of benefits uh, from being out of the, the golden path for enterprise you know, software startups uh, or infrastructure uh, software startups. Uh, one thing we didn't realize at the time was that being out of the Bay Area uh, placed us further away from the, the investors, but closer to the customers. So it was a lot easier to understand what the real problems of companies was, as opposed to uh, what was thought, thought to be you know, cool or uh, fashionable in the, in the world of investment at the time. I would say also, from a cultural perspective, um, it helped us be the, the humble uh, company that wants to learn and grow, as opposed to the no at all company that you know, is explaining to everyone how it's going to be done. Um, you know, we were not the cool company. We were not the cool kids. Um, we were not walking into a customer's environment to tell them how it's done, uh, saying, you know, hey, look, we've been doing that for 10 years at Google. Uh, this is how you should do it. Uh, instead, 
you know, our whole uh, posture with customers was, hey, we'll come in, we want to learn what you're doing, we want to learn what there is to know about your business, how we can be helpful. Uh, and I would say that put, put us on a, on a very different path. The same thing happened when we opened in, uh, in France. You know, initially, when we, when we started doing some significant engineering in France, it was not very fashionable. Everybody had horror stories about the labor laws and things like that. Uh, in the end, also, it helped us build some competitive advantage. I think we could build a team, uh, uh, a highly, highly uh, performant team, uh, very quickly scale it uh, in an area where uh, we are not in the, in the garden of the, uh, the hyperscalers. Um, and we could keep also that uh, underdog um, uh, culture going that, that still, I think, is, is with us today. We still, when we onboard people in the company, uh, we still tell them, we're here to learn. Like, we're not here to boast. Like, you, don't, you won't find us on social media um, pontificating. Uh, I'm not there. The rest of the team is not there. The reason for that is we're not here to tell people what is done. We're here to learn. Um, and we're very happy we chose that path. The, um, you know, I think I'll, a lot of things that you said there resonated a lot, but in terms of the team, you know, that's also been a very kind of unconventional way that you've built out the team. A lot of the team members on your executive team and others uh, and key leaders across the company have been nurtured and grown internally. Conventional wisdom was always, you know, hey, uh, you hire this person for this point of scale, then go to a larger company that's got it all figured out, and you bring in a leader that, uh, that ran a playbook there and, uh, and do that, but you know, you've done things very differently in terms of nurturing and growing people and many of the executives on your team have grown up through you know, Datadog or uh, this is what, probably one of the largest roles that they've had in their career uh, at Datadog, even if they've come in laterally. We'd love to just understand you know, what's driven that mindset and how it's uniquely you know, positioned Datadog for strength and success. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the problem when you could try and do things differently is that it's also hard to get people from the outside who fit in very well. Um, uh, mostly they, they, they haven't done things the way you want them to. And uh, the, I would say the, the first thing we resisted as we built the company was the tendency to just build sales teams and go to market the way everybody else does it. You know, so the, the golden path is um, you are a successful company, you have some product market fit, uh, you raise a big series A or a big series B from very good investors, uh, and at the first board meeting what you hear is, hey, uh, Let's accelerate on the go-to-market side. Uh, I know this person who was the VP sales at that other company that was successful in a similar space. Let's hire them. And you know, what you typically end up with there is a rinse and repeat on what happened at that other company. Like you hire from the top down, so you hire the VP sales. Uh, then they hire the people who used to work from them. And then they hire the people who used to work for these people. Uh, and then you end up with pretty much the same thing, working the same way, the same economics, the same everything. Um, we decided to do it the other way around, which is we did built it completely bottom up. So we uh, started by hiring the first sales rep. So first of all, we did the sales ourselves, like a founding team, product team. Uh, and we built a conviction that product is actually where sales start. Like product teams need to understand value, they need to understand who they're selling to and they need to understand who the product is for, so they're the first ones to sell. After that, we hired our first salespeople. Uh, so one, then two, then three, then the manager for the salespeople, and then we built the organization up that way. Um, what we got out of it, I would say, was a uh, much better economics. Uh, so if you look at the company today, um, we can afford, as a software company, to reinvest about 30% of our top line into R&D because we have a go-to market that's you know, very efficient, like in the 20 to 30% range in terms of the, the spend, uh, compared to most other software companies you know, where the, 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 the sales and marketing spend tends to be in the 40 to 50 to even 60% range, you know, which leaves you a lot, a lot less room for R&D investment after you take some margin, uh, which as a, as a result makes you less competitive in the long run. So we think it's, it's very impactful. We've extended that to other parts of the business. I think in general, we value learning. We value people who build uh, experience over time. Uh, we think that you get better after seeing uh, uh, more cycles in a business. So you know, in the first year or two, you, you, in your first cycle, so you don't really learn much. Uh, three to four, uh, years three to four, you have a second cycle, so you've learned so much more, et cetera, et cetera. We've also learned not to, uh, uh, like one tendency you have is when you recruit for big roles, you tend to uh, underestimate the people you have because you know all of their shortcomings, that like you've worked with them for three, four, five years, you know everything that's wrong with them, uh, and you compare them to people who are you're just seeing for the first time and you know, who, uh, who look great you know, because you, uh, you haven't dealt with all of the quirks. So I think we want to give people a chance. It's not always perfect, like we've made mistakes. Sometimes it's hard to grow people fast enough. We've also had people burn out because you know, we've, we've 
promoted them too fast. Like people had to grow too fast and they reached a point when it was too much. So it's definitely not perfect, uh, but I, I really encourage uh, everyone to give a chance to their teams. Um. That's, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, I think one of the other questions that you just touched upon, and so maybe we'll apply it to another lens, is just, uh, you know, we talk about all the unconventional decisions that uh, the Datadog made that you know, built it into uh, an incredible company today. You know, were there any places that you, you know, took an unconventional path and a contrarian view and uh, looked back at it, and you know, maybe in addition to uh, what you talked about on the people side, and said, oh wow, we made a mistake, we should have just uh, done something more conventionally? Yeah, all the time. And uh, so you know, you're on the board, you know, so, so you know that you know, we, we don't get things right all the time. Uh, and, and you also know that, um, as I said earlier, when, you're, when you take a contrarian view and, and you're wrong, you, you look really dumb. Uh, so you have to uh, be humble and uh, recognize that. Um, one way in which we, we often get things wrong is we, when we think we're, we're smarter than the market, uh, so, for example, when we go to new countries and we think uh, we don't need to customize our process you know, too much for a given country, I would say generally we're right, but sometimes we're very wrong. Um, and, you know, for example, like we sell in Japan, and when you sell in Japan, you need to uh, do a lot more through channel, uh, which is not the way we typically do things at Datadog. We like to be very direct with customers and have a lot of intermediaries. Um, so we tried to go very direct in Japan initially, and didn't work as well as we wanted. So you know, we had to basically do it the same way everybody else is doing it. We come back, we, go more, we build more channel, we build more, more relationships on the ground, we go less direct, and that's fine. I would say it still doesn't change our approach to opening new countries. I would say we, we always uh, try to keep things as similar as possible across the world, and then we only customize when it breaks. Uh, but when it breaks, we need to recognize it, and we need to understand it, and we need to fix it. There's also some areas of the business where we never wanted to be creative. I mean, look, we, our finance department is very, very uncreative in the way it's been designed, and I think it's good. I think whenever you hear creativity and ac accounting in the same sentence, you should, you should be worried, you know. Uh, Apley said the, um, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, we're here at, at Slush and there are so many innovators and, and, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs here in terms of building their business. And one of the things that I've been super impressed by is the fact that while building Datadog, which is a highly demanding, you know, job as CEO of a multi-billion dollar public company, to, you know, take time and, and invest time and engage with innovators and founders at the earliest stages of the development cycle. And, you know, uh, a CEO that we both know well, uh, Satya Nadella, there was an article recently that talked about how he spends a tremendous amount of time with yeah, early founders and others uh, trying to understand the market, seeking aspiration and finding you know, partnerships for the, the business. You know, how are you able to invest so much time in terms of the you know, startup community and, and how does this help you uh, expand your knowledge base and, uh, and thoughtfulness as a CEO? Yeah, I mean, there's two things. So first, I would say it's, uh, it's important to get out of your own head and out of your own company and see the world through the, the eyes of the rest of the world. So part of that, uh, we do by talking to our customers and trying to learn as much as possible from that. But part of it is talking to you know, young founders, new companies, uh, new approaches to problems we might know or we might be new to. Uh, I think it's super important. Um, it's uh, uh, like a big part of our culture, as I said, is we, we're here to learn. Uh, part of that is making sure we, we don't allow to ourselves to believe our own bullshit too much. You know? So we have to see what the rest of the world thinks and a whole the approach of uh, uh, the or, or universe. So I think that's very important for that. The other part is, you know, honestly, it's, it, it's fun to talk to uh, founders, new companies. Um, it's uh, motivating for me to see if I can be of help to uh, folks who uh, you know, uh, are getting started. I'm sure they'll make their own mistakes. Uh, they probably shouldn't listen too much to me when I give them advice, you know, because again, they have to figure out what's going to work and not work for, for them. But if I can be helpful in any way in, uh, in helping them recognize some of the problems they have a little bit earlier and understand that they can do something about it, I think that's, that's helpful to everyone. So I think it's, a, uh, it's amazing to see uh, also in particular how much the ecosystem in Europe um, has taken off you know, since I started Datadog. Like when I started in 2010, there was not much going on uh, in Europe, uh, in tech in general, but in enterprise tech in particular. Uh, now it's a completely different world, and we have all these people here in attendance that are starting amazing businesses, so it's something to celebrate, really. Thank you for the investments that you're making in terms of the startup ecosystem, you know, one-on-one -on -one in terms of 
you know, sharing these unconventional approaches and you know, why being contrarian isn't the worst thing in the world. And thank you for sharing all these amazing experiences in terms of Datadog with this, uh, this audience. It's hopefully a masterclass and an inspiration in terms of you know, many here to blaze their own path in the world. Thank you. All right, thank you.